I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Sri Lanka. Uh, Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished representatives. In 1977, when 150 nations were set to reach agreement on the law of the sea, it was observed that rarely has any generation had so such a clearer choice to make between order and anarchy. For the previous four centuries, the issue of jurisdiction of states was governed by the concept of a narrow band of territorial sea and the freedom of the high seas, which included the freedom of navigation and the freedom to exploit its resources. For centuries, it was assumed that the absolute vastness of the seas and their unlimited resources exceeded human capacity to exploit it. It was only in the later years of the last century that we began to realize the vulnerability of the ocean processes with the fast growth of science and technology. Mr. President, Sri Lanka has been blessed with a geographical location that is much sought after and a highly biodiverse coastal and marine environment. The coastal ecosystems in Sri Lanka provide a variety of services that are vital to coastal communities of the country and the environment as such we have invested much in a blue economy, focusing on economic growth that incorporates and protects the environment. Our coastal zone is home to most of the urban population and infrastructure, as well as bountiful ecosystems that include mangrove forests, tidal marshes, seagrass beds, and coral reefs. As such, it is no surprise that Sri Lanka being an island nation has a close association with developing ocean governance processes. We have been closely involved in the negotiation of the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea and has chaired the third conference on the Law of the Sea towards the development of a new legal regime. Sri Lanka was instrumental as chair in the historical processes that created the three institutions established by the convention, namely the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, the International Seabed Authority, and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Mr. President, it is our considered view that treaties such as UNCLOS, its unified and universal character, allows us to have some control over how the global maritime order evolves and to derive benefits for the people of our country. As we strive to achieve the SDGs, it is evident that if we cannot properly implement SDG Goal 14, we cannot guarantee the peaceful use of the oceans and the freedom of navigation enjoyed by all states. The freedom of navigation over the high seas has evolved over the centuries and is today firmly established uh, both in customary law and in treaty law such as UNCLOS. In this context, it may be apposite to observe that international law has divided the sea into juris a jurisdictional zone and a functional use with certain consequences in the context of maritime security. A coastal state can exercise, as we know, its sovereignty within its baseline and internal waters. It must be appreciated that UNCLOS has made it possible today for several states to peacefully exercise several forms of jurisdiction. The law of the sea has struck a balance, as we see, between the different interests in our oceans. Within the 12 nautical mile territorial sea, the coastal state exercises full sovereignty, save for the rights of innocent passage by navigating uh, states. Beyond the territorial sea, in a contiguous zone, we see coastal states exercising a limited jurisdiction. In the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf, the coastal state enjoys sovereign rights over resources which are living and non-living. We therefore now enjoy the high seas that constitute zones of freedom beyond national jurisdictions including the right to navigate, to fish, to lay submarine cables, conditional upon being compliant with other laws. Mr. President, the deep sea beyond national jurisdiction is considered international heritage beyond all mankind, which is regulated by the International Seabed Authority amongst the 168 UNCLOS parties. All this is possible due to UNCLOS 
as presently framed on maritime issues as a dynamic and enduring instrument. We will soon see new vistas being exploited as we negotiate a new legally binding instrument for the conservation and sustainable use of marine diverse biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction under the framework of the, of, the, of, the, of the convention. It might also be well to remember that a challenge to the several pillars of maritime security are a number of common challenges, which include, Mr. President, maritime domain awareness, the turn to informality in transactional governance, and non-state or gray zone actors, which must, we must take cognizance of. SDG 14C envisages enhancing the conservation and sustainable use of the oceans and their resources by implementing international law as reflected in UNCLOS. These principles enshrined in international law are designed to promote the legal order of the oceans, which is vital for maintenance of peace, security, the environment, health of the oceans, peaceful trade and communications, and it will ensure progress for all peoples of the world. The ocean, Mr. President, is a vast arena covering 75% of the Earth's surface, as we heard it before. It is in this theater that developed, developing, landlocked, and coastal major maritime powers and others interact with one another. And this interaction happens quite peacefully and in a regulated manner for the reason of UNCLOS. Being possessed today of military power no longer assures rights in the ocean. And that is singularly because of the convention, because the convention is the law that rules the chartered seas of today. The convention has revolutionized international law of the sea, as it has introduced new concepts to meet the contemporary requirements of the international community. It has introduced equity into the international law of the sea in the place of traditional law, which tended to favor the developed and powerful nations, the maritime powers. Mr. President, we must be proud of the fact that the Convention provides for an equitable relationship among states in their use of the seas, having regard to their ge geographical characteristics, their political imperatives, economic circumstances, and their responsibilities to the international community. May I wind up by making the observation that the greatest achievement of the Convention is that it has regulated the use of the almighty omnipotent power over our seas by the establishment of the rule of law. The convention has brought peace and order to our seas. Maritime jurisdiction today is no longer settled by the use of naval force, but by reference to the convention. Mr. President, we must be happy today, as we do not hear of people going to war, as they could not agree on a maritime boundary, but referred to UNCLOS as an established mechanism for the resolution of maritime disputes. Sri Lanka, Mr. President, remains committed to maintaining a rules-based order firmly grounded on, 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 on UNCLOS, which continues to serve as the constitution of the seas. I thank you, Mr. President. Okay. I thank the distinguished representative of Sri Lanka.